All right, I'm here with uh, actually a really good friend, Martin Cabrera, who runs uh, a Cabrera Capital, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. But uh, Martin, you and I had a little bit of an opportunity to chat before the interview. I was sharing with you some of the conversations that I've had to this point, and really what the thrust is behind this podcast, which is all about closing the Latino wealth gap in America. And this time we're serious, right? <laughs> yeah, and I, you know, I have my own ideas and philosophies around it. I know everybody does, and I know you do in particular. Um, I think personally, it's going to take a, a combination of some government participation. Government has to commit to this, and they have to they have to invest more in the Latino community. I think that it's going to take a lot of capital. I think that's the one thing people don't talk about enough is that, you know, there's only so much that can happen without capital. At the end of the day, that's what basically governs everything. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then thirdly, I also think it's gonna require some kick-ass entrepreneurs. I call them gangsters, right? So 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 the 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 name, don't laugh too loud, but the name of my podcast, this particular series, I call it Govies, Plutes and gangsters, right? <laughs> okay. And, I, and, and, and I, I think I know which category you're in, but I think everybody might, you know, be in one or two categories. So, you know, um, but we're having fun with it. I've interviewed a number of really compelling people, but I'm super excited about this conversation because I know how committed you are to this cause. I know what a phenomenal company that you've built. And I just want people to just hear a little bit from you as to what your thoughts are around this. So Martin, let's start off by telling us a little bit about yourself. Um, a little bit about your background and a little bit about your business, please. Sure. No. Well, Gary, it's great to be here. Uh, always get to get good to get together and just chat about some of the causes we're passionate about. Uh, so I am the CEO of Cabrera Capital, and we are an investment bank and institutional brokerage firm. So we work with major corporations, private equity firms, pension funds, uh, working on issuing their debt as well as equity and equity IPOs, debt deals. Uh, also, we have a real estate development group, so we have uh, large real estate projects kind of here in Chicago as well as kind of throughout the country and working with other kind of local sharpshooters in, in their respective cities and developing uh, residential as well as commercial uh, sites. And uh, it is something we've, we've had the business for over 21 years. We're, we like to say, the premier Latino financial services firm in the country, uh, working with uh, many of our kind of unions and Taft Hartleys and foundations. So, uh, but really being at the crux of the market where you're seeing capital kind of come into the market and impact our communities, which we really kind of thrive on and try to focus in on as well. So I've been at this for about, about 27 years or so. And I had started up Cabrera back in 2001, but I grew up here in Chicago on the Southwest side of Chicago, La Vita neighborhood. And I knew nothing about kind of investments yeah, that, or the stock market or, or bonds. And it wasn't until my senior year of high school that I thought I was gonna be an architect. And one of my teachers, uh, Jim Artis, he knew I loved sports. So he, he knew I loved competing. And he's like, Martin, I want you to take my econ class and we're gonna go over uh, the stock market and the bond market. And I told him, I was like, Mr. Ortiz, I'm a senior in high school. I'm going to University of Illinois. I'm going to be an architect. I've got my whole life figured out. And he kindly kind of put me in a headlock. He's like, Martin, <laughs> I want you to take my class. And so I told him, I was like, OK, Mr. Ortiz. And you know, he asked us, you know, who knows what a stock and a bond is? And so I quickly raised my hand. I was like, a bond is something between a man and a woman. <laughs> and uh, he's like, no, no. He's like, that's not what we're talking about. And and we're a bunch of Mexican kids from the neighborhood that never had exposure to stocks or bonds. So you didn't grow up in a wealthy family? No, no, not at all. I think we were always struggling. How do we put food on the table? Wow. How do we get to, you know, the back rent that was owed and, and try to pay that? So. And uh, how many siblings did you have? Uh, I had an older brother and I have two younger sisters. Wow. So four and, kids. Uh, yes. And, uh, but it was great growing up because I think you know, with all of the, you know, tough times, the struggles, you know, that you go through life, it actually 
builds that grit in you that you can't learn in a textbook, mm. you can't learn an MBA class, mm. uh, but you become resilient and you just, you get knocked down a lot, but you also get back up. And it's, you know, all the, the trials and tribulations of growing up in the neighborhood, the gangs, the drugs and tough neighborhoods too, you have to get past that and, and struggle through it. But it did lead uh, me to changing my major uh, from architecture, going into finance and changing the university I attended. And, and I think that's a, a question that I would have first for you, and that is, you know, investment banking, right? I mean, we see it in the movies. You know, we, we, we hear about it maybe in the news, maybe those of us that may occasionally read the Wall Street Journal, we hear about investment bankers, but we think that this is, these are people that somehow are like at a different level and they operate in the stratosphere and somehow they're groomed for this from day one. Uh, I have never, I certainly didn't know any Latino mortgage, I mean, mortgage bankers, investment bankers grew up, growing up. Um, what in the world, besides this mentor, made you think that you could and should become an investment banker? Yeah. Well, I didn't know I wanted to become an investment banker, and I didn't realize that, okay, most folks have their uncles and their fathers yeah, yeah. in the business to give them a, a leg up. I just knew I really enjoyed it. I love the competition, and I love kind of being the best, and you want to be number one. And whatever you did, whether it was in sports or in business, you want to compete, and it's taking that mentality and seeing kind of what the opportunities were. And I quickly realized once I got into the business that you can do well in business and be an investment banker, but also see how it's financing Hollywood and see how it's financing development projects mm. and see how it's helping corporations mm. as well. So you get to touch multiple aspects of our economy and not just here in the States, in Latin America and Europe and Asia. And that was really wow. fascinating and wow. challenging as well. It, it, it is challenging and it's remarkable. You know, I've gotten involved, I think, as you know, in, in venture capital, right? So I grew up in the real estate business. I used to be a mortgage banker. I now run NAREP. I do the latitude thing. And venture capital was not anything that was anywhere near my radar, frankly. Saul and I started to recognize that one of the things that we wanted to focus in at latitude was bringing more capital to Latino entrepreneurs for a lot of the reasons that I said at the beginning. And um, there wasn't many sources of capital willing to invest in Latino led <laughs> startups. So we said, we're gonna do it ourselves, right? And you know Saul, he's a force of nature and he says things and he like proclaims that we're gonna be on the moon in you know five years or whatever the case may be, metaphorically, and somehow they happen. But I've learned in venture capital just really what a clicky, business it is environment right you said that most people in investment banking and i think it's the same thing as venture capital they got in because a family member their uncle somebody they come from some sort of pedigree that has created this path for them to get into that business obviously people like you and i did not have that and i think that that really is something that very few latinos have you know maybe not the next generation but certainly in our generation there weren't many latinos that had those relationships no. And so that's those are those are barriers that are tough to break. Yeah. They are tough. These are these are tough walls to get through. These are tough barriers to get through. Somehow you did it. Um, so I'm impressed with that. Let's talk about the numbers a little bit, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm I'm on this crusade to find ways to close the Latino wealth gap in America. And I think people like you are are part of the solution. Capital, right? The management of capital. How much capital is there floating around the economy right now? So Gary, that's a crazy thing. When you think about the pension fund space and the pension, pension fund world, that is a $90 trillion industry. And it's one of the most impactful industries that tap into and, and have impact for major corporations, whether it's housing, so whether like it's Hollywood. So these are like state pension funds? These state are like pension for funds. state employees? These are uh, corporate, corporate pension, pension funds? funds. Okay. Union pension funds as well, where Latinos are like the biggest group of contributors into these members. pension funds, yes. right? So that that industry is roughly a ninety trillion dollar industry. Trillion with a T. With a T. <laughs> and it's hard for people to put their minds around, okay, how can that be so large? But it is. And that is what has been fueling the economy in all aspects. How? The, Explain that. The funny thing is so the pension funds are going and investing their dollars and investing in stocks, meaning companies like Home Depot and Amazon 
and Bank of America and JP Morgan. And those stocks, when they're investing them, drive the stock price higher. So just to break that down a little bit. So, so you have these, these state employees or working for a big corporation. They pay into their pension fund through their dues or through some contribution, right? Mm -hmm. That money goes into a pool and somebody is in charge of managing that money and getting a return on that money because that's better for the beneficiaries of those pension funds. Mm -hmm. And they decide, I'm gonna buy stocks, I'm gonna buy real estate. They invest the money just like anybody else will. Yeah. But only they're dealing with trillions of dollars, not uh, a yeah. couple million. And just to give you a specific example, you could look at California and where the Latino population is 40%. Like yeah, almost, almost half. Yeah. And so every two weeks, those Latino employees that are working for the government are contributing to their pension fund. So it's their dollars that are going into the pension fund. The pension fund is then deciding, who am I going to have manage those assets? It's typically not folks that look like you and I, Gary. It's of those assets, and they have about, just in the one pension fund, about a half a trillion dollars. So what they do, as far as business with Latinos, is about a half of 1%. So not one penny. So out of every dollar being spent, it's not a penny that Latinos are participating in. It's a half of so, one penny. So what you're saying is, if I'm a, I'm a person who's managing a pension fund, you said the California state, there's, there's a big pension fund mm -hmm. there, and I'm going to invest some of that money. I don't just invest in individual stocks. I'm going to invest. I'm going to actually hire people to manage that money for me, mm -hmm. right? Who are experts. So the Black Rocks of the world, the big asset managers of, of the world. These are folks that I give some of the money to to, to manage on my behalf. And you're saying that less than one percent of the money that's being managed, that's being invested by these pension funds, is going to companies like yours. Going to companies that are led by Latinos. And why is that important, Martin? How, help us understand. I mean, that sounds this terrible. Way. It's it, not ridiculous. It, it but, is, but, but tell me why. You that's know, important. I think, and I'm the eternal optimist. So that means that there's 99.5% upside as well. So, <laughs> but you think about it, and it's it really sends a message that as Latinos, we're good enough to put our money into the pension fund system and fuel the economy. Yeah. But we're not yeah. good enough to manage your assets. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And that's not the case because we have qualified Latinos that are out there that are hungry and they're performing. They just never get a shot because they didn't grow up in the industry and don't have those legacy relationships and family members that have been in the business. But tapping into that, that wealth creation does allow you to pierce the veil. And I think we spent a lot of time educating our Latino elected officials of how important that pool of money is. So in California, I think it's about $1.7 trillion. So it's not just the CalPERS pension fund, it's all the other state pension University funds. University of California. University of California, City of Los Angeles, City yep. of San Diego, City of San Francisco. But you so look almost at- Almost a couple trillion dollars, just California alone. Yes. But you look at Texas, you look at Florida, New Jersey, New York, Illinois, and those numbers are the same. New York's a little bit better. Illinois probably has the best numbers for Latinos and African Americans. But this is where you start to pierce well, let, of let, where let, that let, big let's, money and let's influence follow, is. Let's follow the money a little bit and let's talk about why that is so important, not just for the money managers, right? Mm -hmm. So obviously, if you get to manage some money for uh, a big pension fund, you get to collect fees on that. Uh, you get a percentage of the upside. I mean, that's how that game works, essentially. So, so the being able to manage a lot of money benefits certainly the managers of that money but there's more to it than that right yeah. because you and i have talked about this right so so what people don't understand is if if an investment banker like yourself is investing in at&t or investing a lot of money in microsoft or a big corporation you're also going to have a bit of influence when it comes to that corporate they're going to they're care about you because they're going to want you to continue to invest in their company but if you said something like hey we, we want to know how many Latinos you have in your C-suite right now because that matters to us or how many Latinos you have on your boardroom um, because that matters to us. They're actually going to listen to you as an investor a whole lot differently. They're going to listen to some association or some advocacy group yes. who's just sort of picketing or whatever, right? Am I wrong? No, you're absolutely right. And if you could look at the biggest corporations in our country, their biggest shareholders, their owners of their company are the typical pension funds. Yes. 
from California and Texas and New York and Florida and Illinois. And people don't understand the influence that those investors have over those corporations. And it's that rule that he who has the money can make the rules. The pension funds have the money so they can make the rules. And what we're asking is that let the assets be reflective of the people that you represent. You're representing those individuals in those states that are contributing the money. And we'll take the real estate example. So Gary, you're in real estate. If a pension fund came and told you that, you know what, Gary, you really know these markets well in real estate and you know how to go and develop. So we're gonna give you $500 million <laughs> to go and invest and you knowing that Latino community, you know what the needs are, the growth areas are, the amenities that they need, the housing that they need, whether it's for home ownership or even for rentals, you know that you can tap into it. But if we're not giving it to the Latino community that knows those areas. So that market trickles into communities as well. Yes. So it's not just investing in big corporations. You can invest, in, like your company actually invests in real estate projects and they you're more likely because you're Latino yourself. You come from the community, you know the neighborhood, you know the people then you're more likely to understand the business opportunities that exist in those communities. It's yeah. not just doing the right thing. No, it's, you understand it. It's about making money yeah. and performing, and you can get great returns in those communities, in our Latino communities where they're vibrant and they're spending money. So you couple the housing with commercial amenities as well, and that's where you really kind of see, see the incremental value start to kick up. But it's not just uh, like when we're out there developing a project, we are using our Latino contractors, Latino architects, engineers, lawyers, as well as black and white firms too. So that is those dollars are circulating and it's a multiplier. We do effect. business with who we know. All of us do. And they're good. All they're of us great. Do, right? Yes. You know, it's not it's not just a matter of, you know, hey, I'm gonna do it with Latinos because it's the right thing or the folks that are, you know, the white money managers or Jewish money managers, they're hiring people that they know. It's not that they're just trying to screw us over. Mm -hmm. They hire who you know, right? And so if we're managing more of that money, we're gonna invest in communities that we know. We're gonna hire people that we know, mm -hmm. right? We're gonna, you know, we're gonna talk to companies that we invested in and say, hey, I've got some good people that you guys should look at hiring and so forth. That people just don't understand how that works and how important. So when I hear you going back to the first statement you made, which is Latino fund managers, asset managers like yourself, investment bankers are only managing less than one half of 1% of the money that's out there. The cascading effect that that has is extraordinary. I see it a little bit in venture capital, mm -hmm. right? I'm starting to learn that, right? So we have a hundred million dollar fund, which is pretty decent size for a first time fund, but still a drop in the bucket when it compares to all the venture capital that's floating out there. But already entrepreneurs are calling me that have startups, Latinos, that probably would never have had even a meeting with one of the big venture capital firms in Silicon Valley. And a lot of them are really smart, Martin. Mm -hmm. These guys are brilliant and gals. A lot of women, a lot of Latino yeah. women that are so smart, tech savvy, they have you know, incredible educations. They hire engineers from Latin America. They're building great companies and hopefully we're gonna be a source of liquidity for them and a lot of people will follow. I mean, that's the goal, right? But capital, again, is so critical. And that's where, even for those businesses, the pension funds fund private equity, venture capital as well, and real estate. And those are the probably the three biggest areas where you have the multiplier effect. And private those equity, businesses, Venture, venture capital, capital and real estate. And real estate, yep. Those are the areas that you're gonna see a, a snowball effect taking place wherever they're putting those dollars to work. So when you look at, even for a, a Cardenas marketing network, you know, a contra promoter happens to focus in the Latino space. He is number three in the country. So he is causing waves. So Cardenas he's representing, yes, representing Bad you, Bunny. You know them? Yes, Bad Bunny, Maluma. <laughs> kind of Mark Anthony, all the big names, but it's turning the heads of all of the major kind of Anglo businesses, like this is a good business and that they're making money and hey, they're making great profits. My son goes to, went to a high school that was, I don't know, 90% white. And those kids in his high school were singing songs in Spanish because they love <laughs> Bad Bunny. 
They love Nicky Jam. And, you know, so you're right. It's not just Latinos buying Latino uh, music. It's starting to spread and becoming mainstream. You're seeing it. You, he, you see even some of the African-American rappers that are doing cameos with some of the Latino kind of big names yeah, as well yeah. with Bad Bunny because they're getting an exposure. Then they're expanding into a whole other market in South America as well. So it is t tapping into that buying power. And as consumers, Latinos, we are fueling that growth. We have to be on the other end as well where we're creating the wealth and we're participating. So when we're out there buying the Nike gym shoes and the Adidas gym shoes and you know the shirts and the sweatshirts, like we are creating wealth for other folks in the market because that's driving the stock price higher. We need to be the owners and the money managers that are actually deploying that those assets and being the owners and creating that wealth in our community and then circulating it within our community there's, as there's well. a whole world out there that people just don't understand you know yeah. and and they don't give it much thought and it's kind of one of the reasons why those numbers are as bad as as, as you said at the very beginning so i threw a number out there and it's arbitrary i'll admit it i said we need to see the an increase of capital flowing into folks like yourself and our communities by a factor of 10 by a factor of 10. And that may not be enough, or that may be just the right amount, I don't know. But you tell me what sort of impact an increase of by a factor of 10 into our communities would have in Latino wealth in the United States. That would have a significant impact, Gary. And it really boils down to that factor of 10, it's not gonna just stop there and be captive no. in, that, in those no. numbers. It flows. It's going to flow. And right now we're dealing with shortages in employment. It's like all of those kids that are going and graduating from high school, graduating from college, they're going and taking the, the higher paying jobs, engineers, doctors, lawyers, investment professionals, and they have more discretionary spend. So they're going to be going out and Latinos are the first ones to run out and buy the iPhone, the latest iPhone. But we have to not just be the consumers. And that's yes. what I think corporate yes. America yes. thinks yes. of us as consumers, yes. which yes. we are. But they have to think of us as entrepreneurs and business owners. Yes. And that's, that's where they're changing content. the narrative. That's part of the campaign that you and I are on. Um, and, and I do think that the impact can be tremendous. Right now, as you probably know, Latinos have roughly one sixth of the wealth of the you know, average white family in the United States. Um, and that's that's a big difference. It has an impact on quality of life. It has an impact on where our kids go to school. It has an impact on a lot of things that are immeasurable as well. And uh, this won't be an easy thing. How, let's go to the how. If you had a couple of magic bullets, Martin, how would we increase the flow of capital into our communities to managers like yourself, to venture capitalists like Saul and I, uh, by a factor of 10. What would it take for that to happen? Do we have enough talent? There's not a lot of Martin Carreras out there. There's not a lot of Sol Trujillo's out there, but- But there are more that are coming and that are grooming. As those opportunities are created, there will be, if there's opportunities there, you'll see the pipeline grow. And that's gonna come with time. And we're just like every immigrant community, the Jewish community, the Irish community, the Italian community that came over, they understood they were getting educated. And then they started getting into financial services, and politics and other areas as well. But that created a, a swelling of all these business owners that understood that this is gonna help our community by creating wealth and buying homes and being yes. investors and putting into the stock market. So I think that's the key part of it. When you think about some of the solutions, I mean, you could look at Los Angeles as an example. It's like, do your pension funds and what they're allocating out there even reflect your demographics, you know, and it doesn't, it's probably maybe 1% on the pension fund side. But if you start to put some policies in place mm -hmm. that are competitive, where you bring the best to the table, but you give them opportunities, some yeah. will do well and some will not. And those that don't, you fire them just like everyone else, mm -hmm. but it gives them opportunities. And usually those smaller companies are gonna fight more to keep that account and do well. But if you start getting maybe 5% of an allocation to some Latino owned money managers that are in real estate or VC or private equity, you're gonna see that number significantly grow. And they're gonna know those opportunities, whether it's in Miami or Houston or San Antonio or Chicago or New York, to tap into those areas where they can make money. So you don't buy the notion that there's not enough Latino talent out there. 
No. You don't buy no. it. Right? It's out there. People are hungry. They'll go through brick walls to prove themselves. They just need that opportunity to get the assets. I was speaking to a woman who lives here in Chicago. Uh, her name is Oralia Herrera, who's on the NARUP National Board. I think she's just an, an amazing woman. Uh, very humble. Came to this country as an immigrant when she was eight years old. Um, you know, helped uh, her family buy their first home by translating, you know, the, the documents for them. Um, today, and she's still a young woman, you know, I don't know how old she is, I won't say, but she's still, she's like you and I in our, in our mm -hmm. generation. Um, she owns something like 60 properties, free and clear, Martine, right? <laughs> Good for her. Yeah. And, yeah. She, and, and, and she was just lucky that somebody mentored her a little bit, gave her a chance, exposed her to how the business works, and this is what she's done with it. And not only that, she shares her investment philosophy with the agents who are in her office because now she owns the brokerage that she you know, operates under and every one of her clients. She doesn't just sell them a house. She sits down with them and says, now we're going to create a 20 year plan for you. <laughs> and they come back to her and come back to her. She has 450 clients that she not just has sold homes to, but has helped them build a portfolio of real estate. All of them, Martine, right? <laughs> and they're all Latino. Yeah. Right. So that's just a little anecdote. Right. A woman who had no reason to believe that she could do such a thing that's doing it. So to your point, to say that there's not that talent out there or we just don't know what we're doing or there's this big, you know, lack of pipeline is just BS. Yeah, it's they'll ask for a track record. And it's like even the rules, you could be at Goldman Sachs for 20 years and have a great track record. But when you leave there, you can't take it with you. So you have to start from scratch. And that hurts folks. And it's a deterrent from people starting their own businesses. Right. They can be great at what they do. They need the opportunity. They need the access to capital. And without that, you know, it's gonna like inhibit just the growth and some of the opportunities. But I think government has a, a part to play. I think the corporations as well, as many of the corporations are doing well and have record profits, a lot of that growth is coming from the U.S. Latino growth of and the course, consumption. Absolutely, that's the data is there. Yeah, so they, they are, think that we're we all have immigration problems and we all have financial problems and we're basically you know living off the government when in fact the opposite is true. Yeah, you know we're driving economic growth in this country. It is. It's not just our public pension funds, even our union pension funds, where some of them are seventy-two percent of the paying dues members are Latinos. Other unions are 63% and 54% are paying dues members are Latinos. And they are contributing to the pension fund, but those pension funds aren't doing business with those Latino firms. Mm -hmm. And so it goes back to that, that statement, we're good enough to put our money into the pension fund system, but we're not good enough to manage those assets. And that's what needs to change. And given those opportunities, most of those companies are going to do well because they're going to compete and do everything they possibly can to perform and keep that account. There's some that won't, and those that's when those individuals get fired too, just like the Anglo shops do and everyone else does in the business. Well, you know, one of the things that I've got to take my hat off to you, Martin, for is that not only have you built a great company, and how many how many employees do you have? Just we have about 86 so, employees. So, so for an investment banking firm, that's a pretty good size investment banking firm. Um, you are a big advocate for the community. You speak out sometimes when it's not comfortable to do so. Um, you open doors for other Latinos and you put your money where your mouth is. You invest in projects that are also in Latino communities and so forth. I don't wanna say that other Latinos don't do that. I don't think they do it enough, frankly. Uh, I don't think that we have a Latino cabal uh, like maybe we need and we should. And I say that with, with an absolute respect for the Jewish community who, who have done that as a community. We need to do more of that. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think that you know the returns that you're getting for your investors is going to open doors not just for you, for other people as well. But we kind of have to work together a little bit more as yeah. well. Don't you agree? Yeah, I think at the end of the day, as our Latino firms can show success, it kind of does away with some of the perceptions. Oh, Latinos aren't in this business. They're right. like, okay, right. she's been successful. She's opened up another business. He's been successful. And that feeds on itself. And I think even for the Jewish community, 
I give them so much respect because they help each other, they work with each other, Absolutely. they support one another, and they support people outside of the community. Yep. And even I've had to sit down with some leaders that are Jewish and Irish and Italian just to pick their brains where they're kind of mm. sharing some of their thoughts and business mm. to help me along so that I don't make mistakes along the way. And when I do, I kind of turn to folks as well where they can help me. But I think if you were to look at like if the Latino community could emulate the Jewish community and just be a sliver of what they do and how they help one another and promote one another, we would grow a hundredfold as Latinos. So I think it's great to see kind of how they do it and, and then learn how they support one another and their businesses. And and how I they guess, work I guess the, the point of that is that we've got, we've got to hold each other accountable as well. Yes. I, I think it's fair for us to say that we need to do more of that. Um, and you know, I think those are the types of things that are tipping points down the line. Let me, let me kind of close by asking a couple of, uh, of additional questions, a little bit off the beaten path. Tell us about your family. So your siblings, what do they do? Uh, so my sister, Tanya is a recruiter at uh, university here, university of Illinois at Chicago. Mm -hmm. And she also, uh, was chairing the dream fund for undocumented students. That's really her passion wow. is helping, uh, undocumented students kind of get in and then get through college and then providing other kind of opportunities for them afterwards. Uh, my other sister, uh, Sophia, she is in New York. She's actually a global chief marketing officer for TikTok. And uh, she's one of the few Latinas in technology, but she's probably she's got That's an extremely amazing. senior role. TikTok and is like the big thing right now. Yes, Jesus, yes. Man. Wow. And, so she's, uh, in, she's in the epicenter of that. Yeah, That's but incredible. I think part of it growing up in the neighborhood and going through difficult times, it allows you to to really appreciate family and our values and what it means to work and how hard we need to work to do well. But it's not just us doing well, it's all the folks, the Latinos coming behind us. We have generations of younger Latinos that we have to set the example for and working with one another, helping one another, yeah. giving them opportunities. And for the businesses to be civic minded so that they are giving back and giving scholarships and internships and job opportunities and being philanthropic as well. Because that's where we can kind of mm. start to to spread kind of our values and how we help one another, as opposed to some that just want to keep everything for themselves and that they think they made it on their own. And I definitely didn't make it on my own. I had plenty of people help me along the way. And I'm I've always for it. said that anybody who says they made it on their own is a liar. Yeah, <laughs> I agree. I totally agree. I, I had the opportunity to be the commencement speaker at UC Irvine's um, School of Business this past year. Mm -hmm. And I talked about a new version of capitalism that we need and the fact that that latinos and other people of color in the united states that if they're not thriving economically it's going to impact our entire entire economy mm -hmm. that our economy can't grow it can't be prosperous unless the latino community and other diverse communities are also thriving so so that's a message that we are both putting out there uh kids Kids. I have five kids. Holy uh, shit. Yeah. <laughs> it's a small Mexican family. It's a small no, Mexican family. No, that's a basketball family. team. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, but they're great. My daughter's uh, 19 and she's a Holy Cross. And another daughter is St. Ignatius. She's going to be a senior. And uh, my boys are uh, nine and twins that are eight. So, and they're active with soccer and basketball and a bunch of sports. So it's a lot of fun. It's a crazy household, but I wouldn't have it any other oh, way. That's awesome. My daughter now works at Morgan Stanley in New York, oh, uh, which is great. And my other daughter works at NARP and she's in the, the policy side. And then my son is uh, just graduated from college and he's going to grad school. But my point of bringing up family is that the next generation is going to have access and opportunity and relationships available to them that our generation didn't have mm -hmm. and that's part of kind of passing it along and spreading the, the the wealth i've always said that success is a factor of two things martin it's what you know and it's who you know and i don't think people in our community really understand how important relationships are in business and how much they're going to continue to be moving forward so uh, i love what you're doing you and i are buddies we're brothers yeah. um you know that uh, I'm always here for you, and I know that whenever I need anything, I pick up the phone, I call you, and you call me back within minutes. And that's really why I respect you so much and why I have a great deal of faith in the future when it comes to the Latino community. So let's work together and let's make that, that flow of capital a reality and not just something that we're talking about on podcasts. Wow. 
Yeah. Uh, let's dig in. I know that you're going to be at Latitude. You're going to bring together a round table. We're going to dig into some of the, 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 the real nuances of this business. We're going to bring some of the biggest players to that event. It is becoming a marketplace like we always envisioned four or five years ago. Um, and you're one of the key components of the entire process. So thank yeah. you, my brother. No, thank you, Gary. You keep doing what you're doing. And uh, even on the VC Latitude side, it's funding so many Latino businesses it is. that never had an opportunity. You never thought there was an opportunity to get funded. So there's a sense of excitement out there from the VC world and all those Latino businesses that are gonna be coming to you to give them an opportunity. Some you'll take, some you won't, but you kind of mentor them as well. 100%. And know that there's a platform. 100%. If you're not there, then it's totally different and the landscape changes. So it's important for you to be successful and, and to grow the fun and have fun two and fun three. That's and, the goal. Uh, creating wealth and creating a lot more Latino businesses. So it's great. That's it, man. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, brother. Thanks.